We're going to talk about Eliquis, a factor 10A inhibitor, a blood thinner that's been approved in the U.S. for multiple indications, the most important of which is for the prevention uh, and reduction of risk of stroke in patients with nonvalvular atrial fibrillation. We're into year four of our approval. I think it's worth noting that the standard of care is warfarin, which is a medicine that's been around for decades. So uh, we feel it's great that with Eliquis and some of the other similar agents that there are now options for physicians to use other than warfarin, which can be a challenge. We have a large uh, clinical trial uh, database uh, in patients with nonvalvular atrial fibrillation. We completed two large trials, the most uh, significant of which was head-to-head -head against warfarin. Key findings were a significant reduction in the rate of stroke or systemic embolism, as well as a reduction in the rate of major bleeding. So both a efficacy advantage and a safety advantage. Eliquis has been approved in, in for, for atrial, stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation now for four years. And obviously it's important not only to look at randomized controlled trials that led to the approval of Eliquis, but look at how Eliquis performs in real life. So the body of evidence that we're developing with Eliquis is growing. And one area where the body of evidence with Eliquis is growing very fast is the area of real world data. Unlike in randomized controlled clinical trials, which are an important basic evidence in order to gain approval, you know, for, for guideline bodies to, to issue, issue recommendation, it's important for healthcare professionals to see how these new products perform in real life, because obviously the patient population that we treat in is much broader than whatever we can test in a randomized controlled clinical trial. So what we have been working on for the last year specifically is now that Eliquis has been on the market for four years, we were able to look at, for example, major bleeding rates in real life and compare this to VKA bleeding rates in real life. And we were able to show that in numerous studies that we have performed now and that we have published, that the reduction in major bleeding rate as we have seen it in, with Aristotle, our randomized controlled clinical trials, could be confirmed in real life as well. One way of doing that, of course, is the data that we have in the label, which clearly showed again there was significant reduction in the risk of experiencing a stroke or systemic embolism, while at the same time, and I think that's important to, to point out, showing a reduction in major bleeding rates as well because those are the two elements that are most important when we're talking about anticoagulation therapy is patients fear on the one hand stroke systemic embolism but on the other hand patients fear bleeding as well so if you want to show an advantage i think it's important that you show an advantage on on both sides no the stats are similar so meaning that the fact that we have seen a statistically significant reduction in major bleeding in Aristotle or randomized controlled clinical trials, we have seen a statistically significant reduction in real world as well. Physicians always have to be careful switching from one anticoagulant to another. Current labeling for all the agents have fairly clear guidance on how to do that. It's a little trickier switching on to warfarin because its effects take some time to kick in, so they need to be monitored much more closely. But going in the other direction from, from warfarin uh, to, um, to Eliquis, for example, simply knowing that a blood test, the INR value is less than two, enables the switch to occur. And I would say, for the most part, anyone who could take warfarin could also take Eliquis. We actually completed a second trial in patients with nonvalvular atrial fibrillation who were considered unsuitable for warfarin, and that was for a variety of reasons. Most were related to actually having experienced some bleeding or having some concern related to the risk of bleeding. So in these patients that we considered unsuitable for warfarin, they were randomized to Eliquis or aspirin we showed as expected a substantial advantage on efficacy in reducing the risk of stroke compared to aspirin. But somewhat remarkably, we showed no significant increased risk of major bleeding compared to aspirin. 
I'm not sure we know at a, at a mechanistic level uh, why there's less bleeding. In our view, we think it's important that we administer Eliquis as twice a day. So by giving it as split doses, it avoids the drug levels from reaching high levels and at the end of the day from reaching low levels. We think that balanced, we refer to it as peak to trough, uh, uh, is, is a profile that, it, that, that had the potential to confer a favorable benefit risk for the patient, and we think our trials have, uh, have been consistent with that hypothesis. Certainly to have an agent associated with less bleeding has a couple very important implications. Uh, one is that major bleeding itself is a, obviously a dangerous condition. It can be fatal. There's substantial uh, costs associated with that for the healthcare system. I think an equally important reason is with less bleeding of all kinds, a patient is less likely to discontinue Eliquis than to discontinue Warfarin. Because a patient who's not being anticoagulated at all is the one at greatest risk for stroke. So we think that's another important advantage for Eliquis. I think it's important uh, to realize that in different patient subgroups in our trial, including those that doctors would be most worried about, so the very elderly, those with impaired renal function, those who are frail, uh, apixaban performed just as well relative to warfarin in those patients. And with respect to concomitant medications, uh, warfarin is the king of drug interactions with so many. And certainly while there are some that physicians need to be aware of for Eliquis, it's a markedly uh, smaller number. So that certainly um, requires a careful discussion between the, between the healthcare provider and the patient. We, we see patients now, and I think we're, we're all aware, patients uh, are, are their best advocate. They learn about the drugs, they learn about the data, and they often come to their doctors with questions. And certainly we see Eliquis as a good option for those patients, but ultimately it's up to that interaction between the physician and the patient.